five, four, three, two, one. So good afternoon and welcome to today's interactive session of business as usual. I'm Audrey Russo, president and CEO of the Pittsburgh Technology Council. And I am joined today by my co-host of Tech Vibe Radio, Jonathan Kirsting, who's also vice president of visibility at the Pittsburgh Technology Council. So just a few things about today's call. First of all, none of this would be possible without the support of our good friends at Huntington Bank who stepped up to sponsor this series. If you don't know about Huntington by now, they are actually the largest SBA lender here in Southwestern Pennsylvania. I also wanna extend deep appreciation to the team at AT&T for supporting our ongoing public policy series. They have been longstanding partners of the councils and I particularly wanna commend them for all that they are doing at this critical time to give parents, students, and teachers the tools that they need for at-home learning. They have actually recently donated $10 million to support that cause with more than 7,700 students lacking home computers in just the Pittsburgh public school. We all understand how large of an issue this is for our region. So a bit about the technology and the format so we can get that out of the way in regards to today's call. So most of you will notice that we have muted your microphones. I would ask that you keep your microphones on mute throughout the call. Some of us have a lot of background noise going on around us. We want to ensure that everyone will hear our guest with clarity. So with that said, we want this call to be interactive. So please take note of the chat box at the bottom of your desktop screens. If you have questions for our guests, just type in your question in that box along with your name and your company. We will try to answer as many of these questions as possible. And very importantly, this is not for advertising your products, this chat room. Please only ask questions in the box. So now we're gonna jump in and I have the pleasure of welcoming Congressman Connor Lamb. Thank you for joining us, Congressman, perhaps only in wartime has the work of our government been more important than right now? You and your colleagues have taken some bold and rapid steps to help protect workers and small businesses during these past few weeks. I would like to start by, taking, uh, uh, by talking about one of the important programs that you've rapidly as assembled. And that's what we call the Triple P, which is the Paycheck Protection Program. So just a little bit of uh, background here for everyone. So despite an extremely short launch window, most of the regional banks have been able to stand up their loan portals for the PPP loans. But the service level across the institution is, is constant. So many businesses still have not been able to get their applications through to their institutions or find themselves working with some institutions that simply aren't participating in that particular program. There are two major anxieties that are impacting these times. First, they just really need the cash in a hurry to maintain operations. And second, they're worried that the program actually might run out of money before the applications here are processed. So can you talk about this a little bit, the future of the program and what we've heard in Congress? We, we actually have heard that Congress might come back and add more funds to this actual initiative. So let's start with that and welcome Connor. Yeah, I wanna thank you for having me on and uh, thank all the attendees for taking some time out to uh, listen to me today and, and share some questions with me. Um, uh, you know, it has been a very difficult several weeks for a lot of folks I know in the business community and their employees. And we got the news today, of course, that um, the unemployment is even worse uh, in the past week than it was before. And now we have, I think, 17 million Americans at least out of a job uh, just in the last few weeks alone. So we have a lot of work that we need to do together across our entire society. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program was one of many efforts. Uh, we kind of fired everything we could at the wall to see what would stick and what su would succeed. And I think this is one that's going to succeed. Now, the easy thing for me to do would be to take pot shots at the administration for um, you know all of the horrible administrative glitches and delays that there have already been with this 
this program. And, uh, you know, I, I really feel for those folks um, in my own household. I've got somebody trying to uh, apply for one of these loans whose staff sat on the internet for 12 hours at a time trying to get through the portals. So I know exactly what's going on. Uh, but the fact is that anytime our government tries to roll out a new program like this, things like this tend to happen. I mean, you can go back to the launch of Obamacare and you can come up with a half a dozen other examples probably off the top of your head that um, I'm someone who believes the government should try to break new ground and take risks and try new things, but it, it always comes with some administrative complexity. So we have to remember that today is only the fifth business day of the existence of the PPP. Um, so far, I think they've lent out about $100 billion of the 350 that was initially authorized. As far as I know, that money has not really hit people's accounts yet, but the loans have at least been approved. Uh, so it's an important step along the way. So to your part of the question about whether the money will run out, um, I think this is proving to be a very popular program and you already have people on both sides of the aisle in DC saying, we'll reauthorize more of this money uh, and we'll do it soon. But you know, if, if only 100 has been authorized in the first five days when interest is, is at an incredible high, that means we do have a little bit of time uh, before we get to the 350. So I think uh, no one needs to panic and think that someone else is getting the money besides them. Uh, but the one issue that I will put our finger on, kind of what we've seen so far, is that because we're relying so heavily on commercial banks like Huntington and PNC and Dollar and others to do this lending, uh, they are doing what's natural for them, which is falling back on their existing customer relationships and mostly lending to their own existing customers. And larger businesses like Bank of America have even narrowed their criteria further and they've required people to have two or three products with them. And so one of the problems we've seen is that uh, people who don't have a strong current banking relationship, maybe because they're a very small business, like a, like a coffee shop or a barber shop, um, or maybe they are a more longstanding business that just simply paid off its debts already and doesn't have an existing banking relationship or line of credit. Um, my dentist is someone that comes to mind like that, has been in business for 40 years. Uh, people like that are being left out of the current execution of this program. And so I think when we go to refill the, the coffers with more money, we're going to try to create some new avenues to the people who were not reached very well the first time around. So, uh, you know, one thing is that I understand that there's multiple members of Congress that have been diagnosed with COVID and others are in self-quarantine. Can you talk about how Congress will continue to operate in the, in the coming days? Yeah, you're seeing something of a, a generational divide here. Those of us on the younger end of Congress uh, think that it's an absolute no-brainer that we should just be operating as we normally would, but from far away. So we could be holding committee hearings over Zoom or whatever platform you want. I mean, they're public anyway, so there's really not that much of a, of a risk of um, you know, security there. And then when it comes to voting, uh, many of us are in favor of remote voting, uh, meaning finding a way to vote from our own homes right. if we can't be in the Capitol. Uh, the Pennsylvania legislature is already doing that, and many legislatures at the state level around the country are already doing that. Um, I think what happens, though, is when you get to the leadership level of Congress in both the House and Senate, uh, which is split between the two parties right now, there's a lot of strategizing uh, and one side trying to get leverage over the other. And so I don't think either one out yet whether remote voting is in their favor but it's something we're continuing to push for because the fact is the american people need congress at work right now uh, they need us doing oversight they need us uh, authorizing more money and coming up with new programs and strengthening existing programs it can't all fall on the administration that's not how our system is designed mm -hmm. and so we have to keep working and that means we have to keep voting and so we're gonna have to solve this sooner or later so a number of our startup firms are being caught up in something called the affiliate rule, uh, which is essentially denying actual small businesses from being considered as such if they have taken startup capital from private equity or venture capital firms. Do you think this is something that Congress might address in this next round of legislation? I do. Uh, and there have been a, a lot of uh, articles written this week. You've probably already seen them. Right. about how Speaker Pelosi herself, who represents San Francisco and area, uh, is very strong in venture capital, 
um, is trying to uh, find a better way in the next round of legislation to make that a little bit more clear. Uh, again, when you're when you're acting as quickly as we have with programs like this, without the normal committee hearing process, um, without the usual amount of time that it takes to put things in place, uh, it, it's it's what in the military we would call an adjust fire approach. Um, you're very far away, and you keep firing and, and moving the rifle or artillery until so you dial right in on the target. And that's what we're going to have to do. But you can't wait to start firing until your target is perfect. You just don't have time for that. Okay, so we have, let's let's jump into just a couple of the questions. Jonathan, do you see one? Yeah, there's some really, really yeah. good stuff here, uh, Congressman, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, we've got a very, very engaged okay. audience here. Um, a couple of things to kind of think about here, um, looking around, um, adding 501c6s to the CARES Act, and any ideas around um, trying to add some internet uh, legislation since we're not realizing it's the importance of having stable internet and keeping keeping that regulated somehow absolutely uh we've been talking about rural broadband forever i know for me it was one of the first issues i ever encountered as a political candidate because uh the first time i ran i was running to represent large parts of green county down in the corner of southwest pennsylvania uh, where they still don't have reliable internet in a lot of places and it really makes it difficult for them to govern it makes it difficult for their public schools in this time and so uh, better access to rural broadband uh, and more affordable uh, accessible internet in our inner cities as well uh, is probably going to be a focus of either this round or the next round of legislation depending on how kind of the horse trading goes but that has gotten a very prominent place in all of our conference calls with the Democratic Caucus uh, so far. Um, what was your other question besides the internet? And then the idea, um, someone was curious about adding the 501c6s to the CARES Act. Currently, they're not part of that. And there's a lot of C6s right. out there that might need help. Right, I know I've, I've heard some discussion of that as well. Um, I don't actually know right now whether that's being considered, but um, it has been raised by several members of the caucus. And so I know people are taking a look at it. Very good, very good. Okay, so um, our manufacturing firms, let's talk about that and we'll go back to the, the questions in the chat. Many have been deemed to be essential businesses, right? And they've been looking for guidance from us. They're asking if we believe that the state or federal government might expand the shutdown orders. How are manufacturers responding to this in your district and what might they have to look forward to in terms of stricter government rules? Yeah, I, I don't know if anyone really knows. Um, the government is trying to monitor the incoming data uh, really on a day-to-day -day basis. And all I can give you is my assessment that I think the federal government's performance is improving here uh, when it comes to essential manufacturing. So two or three weeks ago, I would have said that uh, the administration is sort of lost at sea when it comes to uh, you know, kind of assembling the effort and organization it needs to build all the ventilators and build all the PPE uh, and the things we really need on the health side to respond to this crisis. Um, but just this morning, I talked to a very, very important manufacturer in that world uh, who was telling me that, you know, now they have uh, points of contact in the White House and the federal government is placing large orders and they're actually going out of their way to help iron out supply chain challenges and get, you know, equipment into the country faster and more cheaply and efficiently on behalf of these manufacturers. So that gave me some confidence that they finally kind of get it. Um, what we also did in the most recent CARES legislation was we set up uh, some funding for businesses that are deemed not only essential, but in the national security interest of the United States. And so there are a lot of firms in Western Pennsylvania that will fit that description. Uh, I think anyone in the world of cybersecurity will probably fit that description. Uh, many of our steel and metal manufacturers will fit that description. And they should be looking for support directly from the federal government to help a continuity of operations um, so that the really the critical functions that our business community performs can continue. Uh, again, that, that source of funding like the SBA loans is brand new. Um, and some of the guidance and rules are still being worked out for that. But that's the kind of thing my office can help with if you are, uh, if you're in my district and you want to 
contact us about the national security uh, funding. We can help get you some information on that too. Okay, terrific. Jonathan, I have more questions here, Roger. Questions, yeah. yeah, absolutely. These things keep rolling in. I'm just, I just can't believe the interaction we're getting here. Um, so let's talk about, uh, we're getting a lot of talk about um, phase four of, of, of the stimulus. Any insights you can provide us on that and what might, what might or might not be included? Yes. Uh, originally, we had hoped that phase four was going to be the start of some of the big infrastructure spending that we all know needs to be done. Uh, it's now looking a little bit more like what phase four is going to be is kind of a, a continuity uh, and a strengthening of phase three. So that means a little bit more focus on the SBA loan programs like PPP, uh, mm -hmm. the unemployment and the health care funding. So a little bit more of the kind of stop the bleeding approach before we cure the patient uh, with infrastructure spending and some of the broader economic things that we need to do. So. Um, that's kind of what we're hearing right now. So uh, you're seeing the debate is uh, Senator McConnell really wants to increase the amount of money available for PPP, uh, which we do also. It's just that the healthcare community is also running out of money. Uh, food bank lines all around the country are longer and uh, more demanding than they've ever been. And so food insecurity is a big issue. Uh, obviously, like we've talked about, the unemployment numbers uh, are unprecedented. And if you think the wait times and snags are bad with PPP, try applying for unemployment benefits right now. It's awful. So yeah. we're trying to make sure we do all of those things rather than just pick one one group for extra help. Yeah. It's just so much all at one time. It's just amazing you guys are able to navigate all of this as far as that goes. Um, we also have some questions about universities and what they're, when they'll get more guidance around around the uh, the CARES Act funding. Is that going to be coming around soon? Uh, I certainly hope so. I mean, it, what, what a lot of us are seeing now, obviously, is it's one thing for Congress to write something into the law. It's another thing for the executive branch to actually deliver the benefits. And so um, you've seen some departments do a little bit better than others. Uh, Secretary DeVos's education department has been a little bit uh, slow in executing the billions and billions of dollars that we gave her uh, to support higher ed. But um, help is on the way. There were a lot of really good higher ed friendly provisions in the most recent CARES Act. And I think you'll see, um, I think you'll see those kind of improved and, and strengthened and better funded as this thing goes on. Fantastic. Audrey, more questions, huh? Yeah, I, is, can, can you comment on the potential support for clean energy, including solar and energy and storage related? Anything coming out in that space? Yeah, I, I think that you'll see that uh, included when we get to an infrastructure package. Um, I think many of us, and I sit on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, so uh, I've been in conversations directly with the chairman where he says, look, uh, we have to make almost every infrastructure move that we make um, not only good economically, but good environmentally, because we all know what the future is gonna look like. It would be kind of silly to um, you know, remodel the house right now without taking the climate future into account. This is our chance. Um, our chance, meaning our chance to make a good investment on behalf of the American people. And so um, there's, there should be that package, like I said, it's not really taking shape yet because uh, we still need to probably do one more package focused more on health care and immediate economic assistance. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot of money put toward redesigning the grid to better integrate uh, some of these clean energy sources. Um, things like distributed electric power, um, and then also, you know, potentially some more specific support for clean energy, or just, you know, kind of increasing some of the key government accounts that go to funding clean energy. So I work a lot, for example, on uh, a program called ARPA-E, which we've been trying to increase funding for for a really long time, very important to the future of clean energy, uh, as well as funding for the national labs. And so I think that research money I consider that infrastructure spending because it goes directly into sort of how we power our day-to-day -day lives uh, and we'll be pushing to have that included. So we're also, people are asking separately about the EIDL fund separate from the PPP funds. Any info about procedures and timing for getting money and money being released? Or is that the same um, in terms of what you were responding to in terms of the PPP? Uh, pretty much the same. I think the only difference with the emergency loans is uh, they were supposed to have an immediate $10,000. Uh, I think they were calling them bridge loans or something. 
like basically a ten thousand dollar grant and there was a three-day window attached to that uh from when you apply so the idea was you apply for the economic disaster loan within three days you receive ten thousand dollars no matter how much you apply for uh, i don't think they've hit that timeline but they are at least i can say conscious of the timeline and so my hope is that if you're applying for one of those you know maybe you'll get it in a week instead of the three days but that that's the only difference i think with ppp and so look, talk, can you again sort of talk about retraining and anything in the plans there for sequence in terms of retraining some jobs you know any anticipation from what you see in terms of new jobs and opportunities on the other side so both retraining and things that you're seeing. Yeah, I, I think that um, as far as retraining goes, there's going to be a, a couple of important aspects to that. Uh, one is going to be just when you see in the media that uh, the Democrats in particular are pushing for immediate large scale economic aid for state and local governments. Um, sometimes we forget exactly everything that the state and local governments are really responsible for, but workforce training and retraining and kind of integrating people into the workforce is a, is a major function of state government, especially, you know, the way it's done here in Pennsylvania. And the state government revenues everywhere around the country are going to be uh, massively short this year, especially here. We've really had a, a much bigger unemployment uh, rise than most other states. Mm -hmm. And so just helping the state government kind of refill its coffers will itself be a job retraining mechanism that we're going to try to do. And that's kind of in the immediate term. In the medium term, when we do a large transportation and infrastructure bill, there's going to be a major workforce component to that. Why? Uh, one of the things that we're going to push for is uh, Davis-Bacon protections and prevailing wage protections on our federal infrastructure projects, meaning that a lot of them are gonna be done with union labor. And uh, unions are some of the best actors in our entire uh, society when it comes to integrating people into the workforce, training them with good skills, doing it quickly and efficiently and getting them onto the job site fast. Um, and so I think that's gonna help, that's gonna help absorb some of these people who lost their jobs in other places, but might be willing to go out and work on a federal highway project or, you know, becoming an electrician and, and strengthening the electrical grid. Um, and then I think the, the third and last thing I would say kind of related to the state and local government funding is uh, in my last two years, besides labor unions, the, the institutions I've seen that are strongest at, at really uh, kind of taking people from zero to 60 uh, in the workforce have been community colleges and our professional and technical schools. Uh, we've got a great set of those around Western Pennsylvania, and they rely on state and local government funding. Um, they also rely on a lot of federal grants. And so we're going to try to target those institutions because they're going to be really key in kind of getting people off the ground with the new skills they need for the jobs that are in high demand. I mean, if you think about nurses, nurse assistants, medical technicians, like the people who actually run these ventilators in hospitals that you hear about every day, right. uh, which we need a lot more of. Um, you know, they go to our, our technical schools and community colleges, and, and those are going to need a lot of funding to make sure they So there are, like in the models in tech and in innovation, there are models of boot camp, like we have a code academy, and we have um, tech elevator, and their presence in the region in terms of retooling the workforce in terms of software and related skills, which are still in high demand. So we are hoping that we see more of that and more support for that kind of work because those are the many of the skills of tomorrow that many people actually can be retooled to add tremendous value. So we are hoping that the, the federal government will see that as a critical piece of, of uh, job development and retooling as we move forward. Yeah, I, I hope so too. And uh, I'd be happy to work with you all on that if there's a more specific way that we can um, advocate for that in Washington. But I do think one of the larger societal changes we're going to see now is, is more people, you know, relying on uh, software like this, like we're using right now, um, obviously online educational stuff. And, you know, there's, this is going to be a pretty massive change in our society that's going to create demand for people with those skills. And we do want to be ahead of the game on, um, on kind of helping create that workforce. I agree. 
Right. And so um, I see one last question. Any programs to boost, let's see, local high tech manufacturing capabilities? We can see firsthand the benefits of making locally rather than relying on um, foreign partners. Yeah, you've got it. And uh, really, the way that we're going to get ahead in the future is to focus on the high tech side. So it's not like we're going to have a future where we bring back, um, you know, the, the really sort of low margin manufacturing, like, mm -hmm. like making these gloves and gowns and, and the PPE that's so critical, but is, is so low margin that it kind of naturally went to other parts of the world. Right. Um, but the way we're going to do it is, is by mastering things like additive manufacturing, and 3D right. technology and all that. Mm -hmm. So Western Pennsylvania is already off to a pretty good start there. Um, based on some of the moves that the county executive uh, and the airport authority have made in attracting right. business out to the airport's uh, space. Uh, the things that Carnegie Mellon has done with its Department of Defense support in uh, the robotics manufacturing, um, you know, they're putting obviously that huge building down in, in the Hazelwood area, mm -hmm. uh, all yeah. devoted to that. What I think we need to do uh, is, is that, you know, if you picture that building down in Hazelwood Green with the big uh, solar, you know, panels on the roof, the old steel mill uh, site, that is one of, I think, about 14 places in the United States that are these dedicated manufacturing hubs. And they each have kind of a different focus. That one is about uh, robotics and it has a defense kind of focus. There's one in, um, in Youngstown, Ohio, that's a little bit more related to um, kind of civilian 3D printing. There's others that specialize in materials science, like the development of new materials that can be used in this kind of high-tech manufacturing. Um, like I said, we have about 14 of those nationwide. Uh, in a country like Germany that really excels in manufacturing, they have more than 60 similar institutions in a country that is only a fraction of our size. So one thing I already thought for this epidemic was that we should grow the number of these institutions, which are really the places that you bring together high levels of federal funding, academic communities, businesses, uh, job training nonprofits. It kind of brings together all the important players and creates an ecosystem uh, around the idea of high tech manufacturing, which is really still in its infancy and you're going to need people to innovate. Um, and then you're going to want to create conditions on the funding so that businesses obviously stay here and employ people. And so, you know, it wouldn't be unreasonable to say in an area like Western Pennsylvania, you could also have a, uh, a medical technology manufacturing right. center. Where we get better and more efficient right. making ventilators. I mean, we already have Phillips Respironics doing that right. in Murraysville and where they make all, you know, you could be 3D printing a lot of those plastic accessories that go with it. Um, and a lot of our high schools already have that technology so they could be feeding employees into this workforce. But it's, as you see with the, um, with the pro procurement issues as a whole right now, it takes a large organized federal response. It doesn't mean you need federal bureaucrats at every stage of decision making, but it means you need the leadership that creating an institution like this can provide and doing the initial seed funding. And then you open the doors to as much of society as you can bring in. Um, so I would like to see that as part of one of our legislative efforts later this year, maybe to grow some of those programs. So that's excellent. I have one question left. I know we only had 30 minutes with you, so we deeply appreciate that. How can Congress assist state governments to help our leaders decide when to reopen state economies for business in a prudent way? Because many of these states are doing things that are a little uneven. And I know that at the federal level, there's been some conversation around that. So what are you, what are you yeah, about? it's all about testing. It is all about testing. So the reason that you can't just pick a date on the calendar right now and say we're going to reopen for business um, is that we still, you know, as of today, April 9th, we feel like we've been living like with this thing forever. We still really have no idea in vast stretches of the country how many people have the virus, how pervasive it is, or how at risk yeah. people would be if they went back out and started working again. Um, we could answer that question with better testing. And that's testing, you know, of the type we're doing in a lot of places right now, which is just positive, negative for the virus. It's also this other type of testing they're talking about, serological testing, where you can see if the person has started to build up immunoantibodies to the virus. So 
that would suggest that they had it and they were either asymptomatic or they've gotten over it. If you could do that kind of testing at a large scale, um, you know, imagine, I've been talking a lot about infrastructure projects. Imagine if you could test 800 construction workers before they go to work rebuilding the locks and dams or fixing a bridge or paving a road so that you know everybody on that, high, on that uh, project is safe and they're not making each other sick. Um, same thing kind of across the economy. It's not just about keeping people safe on the job either. It's also about, think about what consumer confidence is really going to require, right? Who's, even if they start playing professional sports again, who's going to go see the Pirates or Steelers play mm -hmm. in a big crowd if you think, you know, even only 10% of the people there might be sick? You don't want to get sick. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if someone in your family uh, is older or pregnant or, you know, has uh, diabetes. I mean, the last thing you'd want to do is ever expose them to something mm -hmm. unnecessary. But if, if there is very widespread testing, you can start to ease that fear in people's mind and give them the confidence to go out and spend their money. And then of course, give investors the confidence to invest. And so uh, that's how the, your question was how the federal government can right. help the governors. The answer is by just continuing to pay for and provide and push wide scale availability of testing. Well, that wraps up our time with you. I know we have other questions. We'll collate those questions and see if we can get some answers. This is recorded. So we have this on our site um, as every daily session has been recorded and the questions archived and we've attempted to answer. So first of all, thank you, Congressman, for the work that you are doing on behalf of all of us in this region. I know that you are working round the clock and uh, appreciate your leadership as we move into this next iteration. We need you to keep yourself safe as well. So I hope you are taking the appropriate um, precautions. And um, I just wanna tell everyone that we do this every day and tomorrow we are going to hear from the president and CEO of the Pittsburgh Foundation that is working on um, aggregating the COVID-19 strategy for our community. And Lisa Schroeder will be here to talk about that. And we worked in, in uh, and we also wanna remind everyone that we have worked to help amass laptops for the city schools. And if you wanna know about that link, we have that out on our, on our um, website as well hoping that the tech community can stand up and make sure, particularly today, they've announced that the schools will be closed throughout the rest of the school year. So people need the tools to be able to do um, the work they need to do as well as to eradicate the digital divide. So thank you to Huntington Bank, thank you to AT&T, and thank you to all of you that have been on the call with us. And most of all, thank you, Congressman, for the time that you spent with us this afternoon. Thank you all for having, having me. I'm happy to do it uh, again as time goes on. And, and please do, uh, if, you, if you are my constituent, either based on where you live or where your business is or whatever, if, if you want to reach out to our office, we're still answering the phones. We would love to help. And we would love to take your input for each future round of legislation. We also have Congressman Doyle coming next week as well. So thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for being on the call. Stay safe and stay connected to us. And we will stay connected to you.